my name's Glyn Pooley and I'd like to talk about art. This time my subject is... Henri Rousseau. There he is. Born in 1844. Yeah, towards the end of his life, not looking particularly happy. The critics were so mean to him. Not fair, not nice at all. They just ridiculed his, mainly his technique, because he didn't really reach and make artwork in the academic traditions. But there's a few notable artists, Picasso being one, and Matisse being another, who really did appreciate his work. Picasso even bought a few of his artworks and left them to the, the Louvre. So there was a different perspective there coming from artists. And we'll, we'll see why when we look at the work. So it's another good example of just following your own path. You know, that's important in art. Sometimes we can get a little bit wrapped up in all the other artists and all the other traditions. Yes, they can inspire us, but let's follow our own path again we did. Um, and here we start off with uh, one of his, we say earlier works, although he was in his 40s here now. He didn't really start painting until, they say his 40s, well, he was about 35, and didn't exhibit till he was about 42, something like that. And he worked as a customs officer uh, for many years, collecting the customs revenue at the gates of uh, Paris. And I think he found the work a little bit tedious, a little bit boring for his imaginative, creative mind. Um, so painting was the ideal uh, opportunity for him. And he really did tackle it on a grand scale. Some of his works are really quite large, you know, seven, eight foot, nine foot even across. So he was inspired by the grand man of pictures that he saw in the Louvre, but he was following his own vision. So he would have got an image of a carnival, one of the many they would have had in uh, Paris. Paris was a very exciting time around this time, the 1880s, 18. 90s there was a lot of influences going on uh, there was artists arriving there was all the exotic influences from the their colonial france's colonial trade they were putting on these great big shows to show how they were how international they were if you like rousseau kind of imbibes imbibes this and then translates it and gives gives it his own interpretation so you got those two small little figures one looks like a little pyro doesn't it a clown and one's uh, quite a an exotic looking woman but you know more of a, a folk folk that in a folk tradition and they're just quite they're quite small and then they're surrounded by the trees in the background you no know, leaves on which again a, a different kind of scale and then you've got the idea of a full moon now he uses this as a motif quite often the full moon and the full moon is something magical mystical um, and we see this theme just to keep appearing in his work. The idea of this invented, otherworldly, if you like, dream quality. And then he's made this, you know, it's one of the early pictures again for him, this my self-portrait landscape. He said that he invented this kind of genre, if you like. Artists make self-portraits in all kinds of ways, but he, he's, he's invented something called the self-portrait landscape, as you would. So the landscape is an integral part of his portrait. So this is kind of how he sees himself, all dressed in black as the, as the artist, if you like, serious artist. He had that kind of quality. Um, hence, another unusual mystical world, the interpretation of the clouds in the background influence by Japanese prints, you know, post-impressionist post work. He often has this motif of the, the balloon up in the sky. It's a, almost like something that can be used to get beyond, beyond the here and now. It's a motif of escaping up into the clouds. It's a, a transport, which is, you know, form gentle, different, gives a different perspective. So we see that happening quite often. I think the, the balloon was, as a mo mode of transport, was invented about 100 years before that. Um, but it, it had this kind of idea of being able to escape peacefully up into another world, up beyond, up into the clouds. And then you've got this iron ship 
in the background across this iron bridge. Modernity on the banks of the of the same, all included in the picture, uh, with flags from not just around the world, but these are flags from their nautical flags as well. He had a friend who he painted here, Pierre Lotti, who was a sailor that had travelled all over the world and basically recounted his stories. He, he, he published them, but also discussed them with Henry Rousseau, the different places he'd been to, South America, parts of Africa, all the colonial countries. Henry Rousseau took them all in. Rousseau used to say well, in his interviews at the time of the day that he'd been over to South America, that he'd been to Mexico, places like that, and those that inspired him. But the reality was he'd never left Paris. You know, He, he hadn't got further than the um, Jardin de Plantes, which is uh, the gardens where he did most of his research, you know, the botanical gardens in, in Paris. It was his imagination that travelled around the world, or maybe his, his, his aspirations in that respect as well. But conversations with people that had and been to these exotic places, of course, inspired him and guided him as well as uh, enabling him to juxtapose different things into his artworks that might, he might not have thought about. Obviously, maybe this, this Pierre Lotti had a famous little friend here, the little cat on the left-hand side, but the cat is drawn in a very kind of what we call a naive fashion. And this term, naivety, is something which they uh, Rousseau is known for, you know, it's like a kind of innocence. It's a direct relationship understanding with the subject. It's not sophisticated in terms of using uh, visual techniques and perspectives and things like that. It's a deep felt response and just putting it down in a, in a very straightforward way. And it was that quality that people like Picasso really admired. Picasso wanted to paint as if he was a child. You want to see the world as if he was a child again, with all the, the magical qualities of that is, the clarity that comes with that. And Picasso felt, of course, through his very traditional art school training, his dad was an art teacher, Picasso's, brought up in the Spanish tradition, etc., that that was quite a way of stifling and withdrawing from that opportunity to express your imagination. But Rousseau because he had never been trained, he'd never been to art school, he just made up the rules as he went along. He just had this clear vision. He was kind of painting from his heart, really, what he kind of, the, the relationship with the world, uh, and that comes across in some of the imagery. Anyway, this is the famous, the tiger in a tropical storm, or just surprised, <laughs> which was uh, the original title. And yeah, the, you know, we get the idea of the tiger in this space that is being totally surrounded by all these different kind of plants, this kind of jungle. Uh, but the, you know, the mixture of plants that we got there, as I said, the ones which you've seen in the gardens in, in, in the greenhouses in, in Paris, but he mixes them up with some tropical plants that he did drawings of, and some are just house plants, you know, but he's, he exaggerates them, he exaggerates their size and their scale. And he makes this kind of dense foliage. And so you get this kind of flattening of the picture plane. And that's also a motif that he's got with his, with his animals as well. The tiger's drawn, you know, he takes these from books of the time, contemporary books that were published of wild animals from around the world. And he often paints them either side on or straight on, basically because it's easier. <laughs> he doesn't have to contend with different kinds of perspectives. It's not something which he would uh, have any kind of interest in it, but also he was never taught perspective. And for him, of course, it just works, you know. So he, he develops different kinds of techniques. So you get this flattening out of the, the picture plane. Some of these are quite large pictures. And then you get this energy which comes across in a picture like this, everything is on the, the kind of diagonal. And then you're engaged with this, with this tiger thinking, you know, what's going to happen? He's surprised. What's he, what's he looking at? Is there something else just beyond the picture plane he's after? Is he trying to surprise something or has something surprised the tiger? What does the tiger stand for? You know, all these questions come out. 
more pictures we look at with these kind of uh, jungle scenes is there's almost this feeling that Rousseau is living out his life as being these animals, which is all the creatures that he creates. You know, he's using his, his emotions in relation to the, his, his relationship to his life are coming through. Boy on the Rocks in 1895. You know, this is an artist, sees himself as a serious artist who is constantly being ridiculed, attacked by the critics, not being able to show in the main salons, but still persisting. He's on the rocks, you know, he's struggling. There's, there's not a lot of help coming around from the outside. So he portrays all that. It's intriguing by the dimensions of the way he's paid himself. You know, the, the legs are too wide apart traditionally. His head looks too big on a small body. He looks kind of a little bit awkward. Again, there's something intriguing about that. The awkwardness in a world which is blatantly quite difficult. You know, it's all rocky and edgy. You can kind of relate to the emotional feeling that you might have been trying trying to share there. And that mystery which he kind of offers, I think it's what makes his work really engaging. There's a sophisticated naivety, should we say. That's this one, the, the Moulin, the, the, the mill. Yeah, the mill is featured, of course, as a major part of the picture. The flattening perspective is all there again. The kind of perspective is the sort of thing that you would have seen in the post-impressionist work. Maybe people like Gauguin and that, you know, you think about their work. So it's kind of in keeping there. And it's also this flattening. It's also got a kind of modernist feel developed into the 20th century. But, of course, they were saying, well, he's just doing this because he can't paint. But so what? Paint like who? Paint in a manner of the... The Louvre paint in the manner of the great museums. Yeah, that's got qualities, but this has got something else. You know, this can take you and uh, you can ask questions about this in a completely different way. So, yeah, the, flat, the flattening scene is offered. The perspective is completely unusual. That idea of painting things side on, like the wheel, as you see there, or straight on, as you see with the, with the bridge. The way the water is, it's abstract. So you can see why the modernists would play with it and like it. Um, we, but it's abstract, but we can still read all the components. We can still read these as trees and sky, etc. But it's opening other perspectives. The gypsy sleeping, opening other perspectives, other worlds. Again, full moon, that mystical quality of the full moon, shining a light in the depths of the night. This theme of the dream is something which, of course, Rousseau is also known for, which was going to go on and influence people like Andre Breton. It was going to influence the surrealist movement, this this otherworldly quality, and which you would never have got in academic traditional painting. You know, he had so it was offering opportunities. And where does he muster it up from? You know, the, all those things that were happening in Paris at the time, where they were showing. The mystique and people were really interested in the the lives of people from Africa and South America, their stories, their folk legends. Remember, we looked at African masks and things like that, you know, and the French French relationship with that. These these were all things which you know inspired otherworldly imaginations, and he kind of tapped into all that. And you've got this intriguing image where, you know, the lion is just almost nudging this uh, uh, negress lady wanderer who is also like um, in this unusual dream state uh, with her instrument there to take us to another world again. She's got this technicolor coat on and it's almost as if, you know, the lion and uh, having a conversation or connecting in the dream world. And this is something which he explored a lot. And in that dream world, you're open to tremendous possibilities. It's another world, isn't it, when we take on a state of dream. As we remember certain things from it, but they're sort of solid, but they're sort of not. But they're deep, and they're coming from our subconscious. And he's tapping into our subconscious with these kind of images. So they become universal.
So once you've seen them and seen something like this, they kind of stay with you because there's a kind of clarity, uh, clarity to it. Yeah, fascinating. The Gypsy Wanderer, Negro Gypsy Wanderer. The gypsies originally came from India, passed through India, but also there's the combination, the connection with the vastness of Africa there as well, or the exotic, or the imagined world. And then that one step in this other dream world and the one in modern technology, what was going on? The Eiffel Tower hadn't been built that long after this was painted. The Grand Seine leading up to it. But an intriguing perspective on it. Everything was leading to that. But again, he's got a kind of sky which is magical and mystical and spatial. Simplified trees, simplified boats inspire imagination. Hints at technology, got the towers of industry, the buildings, all one thing overlaying the other. Of what he sees around him, but how his, ma how his mind translates it. That's what makes us, as human beings, totally intriguing. We are all unique. We all have the opportunity to use our minds in incredible ways and share our visions, you know. And no matter what you put down on a canvas or a piece of paper, it's going to be unique to you and someone's going to be able to connect with it. That's why there's so many different kinds of pictures in these uh, galleries and museums. And here he is uh, as a self-portrait with a lamp in 1903. You know, you can see him as a kind of customs officer, civil servant in a way, but with a twist. He kind of, uh, he's decked out in this kind of finery, but he, he also got this quirky quality, though. The bow tie is just tiny, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's out of perspective. He's got this lamp with him, you know, which could be a symbol of light and insight, you know, transferring, going to another, another world. It's got kind of definite stare out and beyond the canvas into the visions of another world, another another place. Nicely manicured moustache there as well, give us the job. Yeah, intriguing. And then we've got these, some of these jungle scenes. Woman in a tropical jungle. Um, so the woman is dressed in contemporary Parisian dress, you know, and kind of finery, really. And then she's in this amazing, unusual world, whereby the plants and the in this case, oranges and things like that, are all completely out of perspective. They've all got kind of enlarged, and they are kind of consumer. They're all around them. So they have a kind of decorative quality. So there's a decorative quality to them. There's a flatness to them. They're built up in, in thin layers of paint, but they kind of embrace the figure. But they embrace the figure and put it in a certain kind of perspective. They embrace her. Yeah, but on one level and another level, they kind of almost overwhelm her, you know. They're, they're out of scale. They're be, beyond the human scale. They're the scale of the imagination, which is vast. And it gives us the opportunity to think vast as well. And then <laughs> this intriguing interpretation of his, of his different animals. It's really hard to make out what animals they are. So he's, he's based them on things that... He's partly seen in, in books, but he gives them this human form. You know, they're almost like, like I said, they're like almost like self portraits of him. You know, when we were looking at like African art, we, we saw that a lot of tribal art, they used to make masks of animals and they wear animal skins to empower themselves and take on the characteristics of those particular animals. And I think, um, Rousseau was kind of trying to do that. A little bit as well, you know. Some of you might wonder what it is. They're supposed to be panthers or are they bears? You know? Some kind of bird. Uh, but, he, you know, it's not anything quite specific. It's almost something. It's, a, it's like a accumulation of a number of different kinds of birds. But he, he has this motif of this bird symbol. And it's the kind of almost like symbol you would see in ancient Egypt. You know, it's an, it's an iconic bird. We know it's a bird, but it, it, has, it takes on that kind of persona, but it kind of questions us. And it just sits there on the branch, staring at us often, while other dramas kind of take place. And whatever plant took his fancy, you know, whatever this is, work on that, is it just kind of takes his, and he just places it all together. But they kind of hold together in a very unusual way. And I, I think that's what makes them kind of uh, magical and fascinating so these component things are all there we see 
for staring out on us on a branch often, challenging us. We just think about bird world, whatever that is. You have this strange bear kind of creature in the background, semi looking half on, uh, in the background doing what? We don't know. Thinking what? Don't know. Why is the bear there? Not sure. Ask the questions. Use your imagination. What do you come up with? You know. Then you've got so many gestures, these kind of strange animal features, which are there. This kind of strange back scratcher, which is there, you know, the sort of thing you'll be back with. So there's a kind of tickling by this, what's this wild boar with a nose ring? They're all having a strange gathering. So these animals are having these kind of strange party in this unusual jungle. And we're being questioned to ask ourselves, what is going on? What is happening? Now I wondered, why does he paint jungles often? Well, they often say cities are like jungles, aren't they? You know, there's so many kind of hidden potential threats, but there's also exotic qualities and intrigue and interest in cities where anything and everything is possible. There's so many different kinds of personalities. There's so many kinds of things going on. And he does that. He creates that world with his animals and he creates the jungle that maybe he's living in. He's in Paris. He's thinking exotic. He's kind of overwhelmed by his jungle in some respects. But because it's nature, it has a nurturing effect as well. Going into those gardens, it uplifts. And this much nature enables you to kind of counteract your urban jungle. So they go side by side. And here he is in his dream garden, riding on a tiger, as you do. <laughs> Why not? You ride on your tiger, you've tamed your tiger, you play in your little, what is it, like a little small guitar or possibly a banjo. You're singing your song, could be a folk song, another world. So you're in another world and the lion looks on, questioning, what is going on? <laughs> and that's a, a rhetorical question. We get an opportunity to think, what is going on? It's magical, it's mystical, it's exciting. It's dreamlike. It's we are one with the tiger there, and the tiger is powerful, and the tiger is storming through this, through this jungle, and we're gently singing and playing our little instrument on top in a kind of regal way, all dressed up as a traditional artist, serious traditional artist, and overcoming all the things and all the things and arrows that the critics and everyone's throwing at them. It's it's incredible, really. Um, and then he has he creates these iconic strange images the snake charmer this black figure it's almost like a kind of black garden of eden there idea again with with the night of the full moon you get the snakes of temptation or traditional wisdom and things like that you get these strange exotic birds it gives it their twist like the dodo, pink dodo, something slightly on the verge of extinction or not otherworldly. The main character is playing this mystical flute again, summoning up and another world. In the snake charmer was something mystical being that can c control a vicious snake and stop it biting you, etc. Even though often they had the poison taken away from them. So it was a way of taking control of your environment again and being engaged with it but in an in a from a perspective that is beyond the here and now and then we look up in a tree oh back 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 we look up in a tree and that little bird strange bird whatever again is staring at us you know questioning us not taking flight or anything like that not showing his wings don't look as if those wings could fly they look too big and too flat but there he stood there just on that on that branch asking us questions. Yeah. Themes of uh Ooh, so fantastic. <laughs> it makes you laugh, doesn't it? It just makes you chuckle, some of them. You just look at this lion and you think, oh, My goodness, that's some picture of a lion. It's almost like when you see in a children's book, isn't it? It's bordering on that. And then he's having a fight with a leopard, you know, he's having a he's eating him. And then he, he kind of takes on, he, he puts in other things that he sees, but like bananas. But he only sees the bananas, but he's never really seen bananas. Bananas grow vertically, go up, not down, and things like this. You know. And then you've got the light in the background, so there's optimism and that. 
and they're caught in this magical green forest again with flat layers of uh, color. Now you can see the component images, this other world, you know, of the, uh, of the forest, of the, the big garden. The garden in the biggest sense of the word. We're all living in a garden in some form. And light in the background, the universal light, you know, sun, enlightenment, etc., etc. All those motifs are in it. So great opportunities. And this one again, this is his interest in the exotic, you know, the things that would come back from, from Africa and uh, would have been seen and shared and shown from, from that. Combined with you know other kinds of plants from the east, maybe little lotus plants, slightly modified pink flamingos, <laughs> as you would have to put in Africa, all in this great big lake. But it would have been maybe a big big river. But they're just fascinating. It's just his opportunity to express himself with these, and uh, we can we can go there with him. Uh, more of his. Jungle scenes with his tiger and his buffalo having a fight there. What is it? Who's the tiger? Maybe it's partly him. Who's the buffalo? You know, is he being attacked? What's being attacked? You know, all these questions come out. All the different plants are there. Again, the exotic plants all surrounded the main protagonist in the picture. And just making it into a rich image. And as I said, some of these are really quite, quite large. The oranges are there again dotted around exotic plants, you know, all these kinds of things from these other parts of the world, which would have added mystery and magic to the whole experience when he's painting them as well. He's kind of documenting them. He's excited by them and he's putting them in his picture. All these things were new. We take a lot of this for granted now. We go to the supermarket, see all these kinds of things. Didn't have them then, didn't they, years ago? Uh, so to put them in his picture, you know, it was like as if he's bringing them into his world. And then, and then share them. So creating a, a fascinating experience. And we see a certain kind of naivety in this one, you know, football players. Yeah, it's a strange way of playing football. It, unless he's throwing it in from the touch or his handball. I don't know. Some people said this looks more like a rugby match could be. Rugby hadn't been, been invented not long before that, had it? So, but it, these players are in a garden anyway, and his figure's trying to tackle this one. They're all little Russos, isn't they? <laughs> you can see the little Russo face there. Little, he often painted his old self-portrait on these kind of figures. But maybe you've seen something and thought, well, this is great fun. This is joy. And it's going on in the park or in the garden there. So let's just paint it, you know. It's still my kind of version of it. So that's what he does. Oh, more of the uh, exotic landscapes with the, with the monkeys. That's that bird again just staring out at us. The oranges there at the game, they're all hidden in the undergrowth, playing or intriguing or having fun or partly hidden by the kind of jungle. Doesn't it? They just ask so many questions. There's so many potential metaphors in these pictures. The lovely interplay of the different leaves from the different plants there, play side by side. By mixing up perspectives, it just makes it more interesting and it's exciting. All on that flat plane again, but with a bit of space from the background in the sky. Let's have a go at more of a traditional bouquet of uh, flowers. So we, you know, we see his painting language clearly there, flattening of the of any kind of perspective, studying the plants, often looking at them either face on or editing them to be side on. Strip of ivy down the bottom, the ever, evergreen, uh, so this kind of symbolic, optimistic kind of plant. And there he is, just keeping it very flat, almost graphic, but simple but documenting all you know all the specific plants it is again here got a green version then we have a kind of ready pink version they're all kind of flat again bit of a curtain behind you know all the sort of things you would have seen in the um in the museum which would have been painted in you know grand perspective and illusionism and his version you know which is you can see why the modernists as i said earlier kind of liked it you know it opened up those possibilities whereby you don't have to spend all your time working on the illusionism of perspective maybe as the dutch masters did with their still lives you can focus on color emotional content you know there's a richness of red in that the flatness of the red against the flatness of the white it gives a completely different feeling emotional feeling and you can play around with those kinds of qualities 
and uh, here's a balloon in the background again with his uh, vision of uh, pont a and and combining with modern technology the airplane hadn't been invented that long there 1908 i don't know when it was wright brothers and all that kind of thing only a few years before so his imagination is just always been intrigued interest by what these kinds of things are going on interest intriguing drawing or painting of the boat there simplified yeah two little diamond eyes in it but you know it almost has got a kind of monastic quality in the way that's been painted as a like a monastic headdress this is very straight very angular so you know open to interpretation again levels of interpretation modern technology water fountain water stack and the trees all those kinds of component elements are there that he would see around but given his own quirky vision and he was inspired by the muse um, he did have a polish mistress actually when he was young it's a bit of a he, he did have to see early on this bit of a side i think uh he got caught went into a bit of mischief i think he even did a month in prison uh, him and a few of his friends when he was a teenager i think they stole something or whatever or they were trying to get their own back on someone and, and then he had to join the army to get out of it so he did join the army but before he could get into the army if i remember correctly he had to do a month in in, a, in prison so he always had that kind of you know mischief in him maybe and he had a polish mistress that she kind of inspired him painted cut <laughs> the way those kind of flowers are painted and the, the leaves and everything and the quill pen yeah everything's exaggerated everything's open to interpretation oh you can see i was thinking of beryl cock and people artists like that from the mid-20th century kind of being inspired by this um or a number of those other surrealists you can see how they were being intrigued uh, and then the, the equatorial jungle a couple of little figures with a human face there again in amongst the center i'm all surrounded by the overwhelming uh, but intriguing jungle don't forget our little birds up in the tree there again and this was one that was a portrait of his early polish mistress sat on this kind of strange bed in the um in the jungle there's this snake charmer again mr mystical snake charmer taking us to these other worlds the bird side on little elephant there look with a lie and a trunk in the background the lions are about to come out and confront us snake in the grass oh, oh what a journey what an opportunity to uh, be you know intriguing oversized exotic flowers there hint at lots of different things that's what makes his work interesting a lot of his work is coming from his imagination he's not just painting what his eye sees of course he's painting what his mind's eye sees and how he relates to what his mind eye sees if you like this video don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification